And people, some people have gone, oh, nobody's asking for a spit test. My and answer to that is yet, yet. And, uh, and we ought to make sure that we lay that marker down very, very soon, and uh, we're, we're doing that. So uh, we think there's going to be a lot of bipartisan support on that and hope that that is going to be the case moving forward. Um, uh, we are uh, we're, we're continuing to work on issues like the Great Lakes, uh, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, as uh, well as uh, as a number of the other things that affect West Michigan, uh, whether it's manufacturing, agriculture, obviously tourism. Inflation has hit everyone, right? It just simply has. Uh, we're at seven and a half percent annual. If you look at what happened in January, we're at five plus real terms over the last year. And uh, this is significant. It's not transient, meaning it's not temporary. That's what had been the line uh, from the Federal Reserve on down. Um, they, uh, that Jerome Powell finally admitted that. Uh, he, uh, he has dropped that word transient. Um, the, uh, the, the simple sad fact is we're so far behind in where the Fed, in my opinion, should have been, and many other economists will agree with that. Not that I'm an economist. That don't, don't, the worst only thing I can do. No, not a judge, sorry. 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 Come, we got a couple of judges. Nobody's awake here. They got an alter here. We got Paul Krause. We got a number of people. Sorry. I only, apparently only I think I'm funny. So that's, uh, it, um, I got saved up. It's, it's, it's a tough crowd. It's a tough crowd. Uh, <laughs> All, all that, uh, uh, all that to say is, uh, we know that there's real effects on business today. Whether it's with, uh, with material, whether it's with transportation, uh, whether it's even human capital uh, coming in, and, uh, it, and it has to be addressed. And the sad fact is, if the uh, if the Fed doesn't stop this tapering, uh, meaning that we are buying 130 billion dollars per month. Internal, right? Uh, the uh, Federal Reserve purchases from the Treasury $130 billion a year to keep interest rates artificially low. And uh, what you're going to see the Fed have to do is potentially even do like a half a point uh, tick up in, in interest rates. They're talking about two of those this year. Um, had they started this two years ago or more, uh, it would have been much more gradual. And um, sadly, it looks like we're going to have to shock the patient with this economy going on. So, uh, there's a lot of layers to that. I won't go into it anymore, but I'm happy to take. We have time for a quick question or two. We'll see if anybody woke up in between. <laughs> yeah. Uh, question about this is a personal um, question. Um, you know, I know it's in between. You know, giving them some. You know, right now they're out in limbo. So just, what is your stance on or that, or how can you help the doctor? Children or adults now that were brought here as children, what, how can we help them? They're in limbo right now. So. Yeah, there, there's been a lot of limbo, uh, frankly, over this, uh, over these issues of immigration. <coughs> like the closest, the closest that we came was a few years ago when Bob Goodlatte, who was the chair of the Judiciary Committee, we had something that was not very original, uh, but it was called the Good Lap One and the Good Lap Two. Those were two options that uh, that would have attempted to address, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, both the DACA promise, uh, uh, the, the kids that, uh, that literally came across with no choice of their own, right, they're three years old, they're going wherever mom and dad are, uh, and distinguishing those from the folks who have made a very conscious decision to either overstay visas or not even attempt to have visas uh, uh, in the meantime. And uh, I, was, I was just listening to, um, radio on the way in, and one of my former colleague, colleagues, uh, Carlos Cubello, who's from Florida, was, uh, was talking about this, this exact issue. We have a real crisis on the border. I mean, it, it, it is significant. In fact, I'm scheduled to go down there in, uh, I think it's March, Mar beginning of March. Uh, Todd and I actually are, are both going down. Um, we were supposed to go down at the beginning of January and literally spent the day at Grand Rapids Airport, if you remember that, January 3, 4, 5 snowstorm that came in. We couldn't get out uh, to get down there, but um, we, uh, we know that there's real issues there, and we also know that there's real issues about these kids that, that, that are here uh, and in that limbo. And what 
there's been probably some of the attempts have been to solve it all at the same time. Um, and I understand that sentiment. It's just very, very difficult to be able to do that all in one big fell swoop. You, however, do need to have some types of agreement about these various parts of the immigration issue. And so far, it, honestly, the biggest issue is there's just no consensus. Uh, that That is what's holding it up. And, and typically, Washington, D.C., uh, waits until there's overwhelming consensus, and then things will crumble very, very quickly. Um, unless there is an attempt, as there has been a couple of attempts, to do things uni unilaterally, meaning only the Democrats or only the Republicans. And that's what happened with Good Lab 1 and 2. Uh, we thought we had had, uh, we thought we had, had a consensus. Uh, there was a, that one of them, I forget which of the two it was, but one of, a, one of them, 197 Republicans voted for it. And we were we were told that there was Democrat support, but uh, they were held back. And once again, we're seeing this issue become more of a political football than it is a problem to solve, and that's that's very very unfortunate. So, uh, but very very aware of it. Discussions about it, just no consensus on how to move forward with it yet. Yeah. How about one last quick question, Michael? When we were together in December, you were working on a long-term plan to tackle the debt ceiling. Is that one that you thought that you made any progress on that since we were together last? Uh, great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so uh, not as much as we would like. Uh, frankly, what happened is, and I think that, uh, what we talked about at the breakfast of the bill was our 30 by 30 group, which was 30 Democrats, 30 Republicans working very specifically on debt and the deficit. Um, measure towards cut lines. Okay, uh, we are working at trying to figure out what the path forward is. At the end of the day, the idea was that we were going to have a group of us that were going to try to stick together to really try to push, even if it was small change, some form of, of structural change. <clears throat> and that could be in uh, reporting, it could be in doing some studies about making sure everybody was on the same page. Um, and because I'm not in the majority, I had to sit back and knew that I was agreeing to having to maybe take some really bad votes, because some of this stuff would maybe be attached to some things I really didn't want to have happen. My Democrat colleagues were having to work on trying to figure out how they get their leadership uh, to, uh, to insert some of these things that they didn't want to have put into these bills that they did want to have. And at the end of the day, that didn't happen. And uh, the idea then next was if we didn't, as a group, this 30 by 30 group, didn't get some of those reforms, then we were going to refuse to vote for these packages. <coughs> that didn't happen except for one guy, uh, Jared Golden. And he, out of our group, he was the only one that, that stuck to it. You know, and obviously once they didn't insert that language in, there was no expectation that the Republicans were, were going to have to vote for it. Um, the uh, and so and, and I get it. There's, this is the this is the challenges of being in the majority. There is a burden to leadership and a burden to being actually in government, and that is one of those. And unfortunately, it didn't culminate. So honestly, we're trying to figure that out. Uh, whether uh, whether this group is even able to move forward. I'm not giving up on a balanced budget amendment uh, to the U.S. Constitution. I don't think we can. Um, I'm trying to, uh, to no pun intended, reconstitute that group as well. Um, and uh, it, it is fully expected the Republicans are going to be coming back into the majority. It seems on some of these financial issues like that, the Democrats have a little easier time going, well, we're in the minority anyway, and so I, I, I need to kind of punch up my, my, uh, my uh, spending hawk uh, sort of uh, profile, and it seems like that's a little easier for them to join rather than the Republicans going that direction or holding their own party to account. It's tough. I get, I, I've been there. I've been in those seat meetings, and uh, some of those toughest meetings that you have are with the folks in your own party going, okay, we can't continue to just be Lucy here pulling the football out from Charlie Brown. We have to deal with this issue. And, uh, and that's a very significant one. 
So um, anyway, so that's uh, that's a quick little update. We'll be sticking around and uh, glad you didn't ask about redistricting. But uh, at, at this point, um, there's really no significant changes. There are some lawsuits that are uh, that are underway, mostly surrounding Detroit with the Voters' Rights Act and the concept of one man, one vote. That is. Uh, that had been enshrined since the 1960s. Right now, none of the Michigan uh, districts uh, are actually the same size. Uh, so there's going to have to be, we believe, probably going to have to be some adjustment, but it's going to be, in, in all likelihood, very minor. So at this point, it looks like uh, it's going to be for the fourth district, southern half of Ottawa County, Allegheny and Buren, northern third of Marion County, Kalamazoo, except for the bottom tier of townships uh, of Kalamazoo County, and then Battle Creek and the four surrounding townships there. So that's what's going to be the fourth. The third is the northern half, Fillmore Street, north of uh, Ottawa County. Uh, then uh, Muskegon, Muskegon Heights, North Shores, a couple of those communities in Muskegon. Uh, and then the city of Grand Rapids and the surrounding suburb suburbs that are currently actually in this uh, second district. So. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting year, so I'd love to hang on. So thanks everybody. Good to be with you. Congressman, we appreciate you uh, giving us time this morning. Thank you very much for those remarks. So now we're going to shift gears just as a refresher for everybody because it's been a few months since we've been here together. Uh, this season we've combined our public policy and our government affairs into one, and so this is our advocacy and action. We're going to take a little bit more of a local focus right now. I'd like to involve, invite Paul Sachs up here. Paul is the director of the Department of Strategic Impact for Ottawa County, and he's going to give us an impact, an update on what the ARPA dollars are going to do for us here in Ottawa County uh, in the coming weeks, months, and years. Sorry, Paul. Good. Thanks so much, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is a pleasure for me to start my Monday and my week off this way, so thank you very much. And thank you to Jane and staff, too, for inviting me to talk with about the federal recovery dollars. Nope, let's see if this thing will work. It ran appropriately. Yes, so as most of you probably know in this room, Ottawa County was provided $56.68 million in federal recovery funds. And those funds are part of the larger American Rescue Plan Act that was passed last year, March of 21. And that total bill was $1.9 trillion. And within the ARPA package was $350 million for states and local and tribal governments to respond and recover from the impacts of the pandemic. And the county distribution, the part of that package overall, is the state and local fiscal recovery fund and our 57 million, 56.7 million dollars was distributed to counties in basically the variable um, was part of a per capita basis. So out of, in the state of Michigan, most 83 counties that range from about 400,000 uh, for a county all the way up to about 340 million dollars. And out of the county, 56 point million was received got half of it, uh, split for all counties distribution in two parts. The first half was distributed in May of last year, and we will be getting the second half uh, in May of this year. Some of the key components to these funds are that we need to identify how we're going to spend the funds by the end of 2024. Then we have until the end of 2026 to spend the dollars. And it was surprising, you know, it's so much being honest here, surprising to us that there are some communities across the state that they immediately, they had their projects, you know, and they identified how they're going to spend the funds right away. And we started that process even before the final rules came out, just in January. So for us, uh, we've been taking uh, much due diligence and care, thinking about the most appropriate way to spend these funds. And in the final rules, by the 
Treasury and of summarizing what the key focus areas are to spend the dollars there to maintain vital public services and, and replenish local government revenue loss. Also to invest in water and wastewater and broadband infrastructure and, more importantly, to help individuals, households, and businesses recover from the impacts of the pandemic. Also, another important component to these dollars is to ensure and apply a lens of equity in terms of distribution. As we think about and identify projects, what are those with the, with the most need and the most impact across the county? And as a county, we've been very successful, remarkably successful through our partnerships, public, private, nonprofit sector. And it's one of the, the joys that I have in working in county government, especially in this area, is we collaborate so well to identify needs. And we have been successful in identifying inequities and working to advance prosperity and health for everyone across the county. The, these dollars offer an incredible opportunity for us for some very significant transformational impacts in our communities and for our residents Need. So we have been, and that's part of the reason that we've taken our time, we've taken our care, and thought really strategically how we want to best utilize these dollars. You think of the end of 2024, it seems like, oh yeah, that's a ways out, but we know how fast a couple of years can move. So we're working really diligently to identify this work. And it started when the Board of Commissioners last that was early summer, they identified a steering committee for these funds. It's a, a tremendous group of community leaders from local government, nonprofit, foundations, chambers, economic development, higher education, such an incredible group that pulled together the passion and a pulse on needs across the entirety of our county. And one of the first things they started that they worked on was to identify these lenses for evaluating what are our high priority areas across the county that we can use these unparalleled funds for. And one of the first items that came up, obviously, and there's six criteria in these lenses, we need the basic eligibility criteria in the final rule. And also, that the projects need to address a known and demonstrated also, to look at projects that eliminate those disparities and those gaps and, and addressing you know, the service and needs of underrepresented um, and marginalized communities. It's very important to advance what we need to do. The project, also another consideration is without these funds, these ideas would not otherwise materialize. We're looking for transformation, long-term once in a lifetime opportunity to make some real moves for our community. And part of it is, one of these criteria, is that long-term sustainability. How can these projects, what they may be, we don't know, like we have, we have some ideas, of course, but what do these projects look like? And can we evaluate them, whether or not we fund them, will they be sustained for long-term impact? And can we quantify those results. That evaluative component is also very important. I'm not just going to distribute dollars and say, okay, there you go. See, you know, good luck to you. It is provide the dollars, support, do the evaluation to a degree where we can really see the outcome based impacts. We want to be able to demonstrate as a county that the funds that we receive did have that impact that we really need. Transformation is, is the buzzword that, this, that our committee talks about. Our priorities, we put these into buckets, and working with the steering committee was a real joy for me, and as I mentioned earlier, a passionate group is outstanding. And this is where their expertise and their understanding of community needs, it, it's radiated in that 
that group. And they started to filter in between the large scale meetings we had with this group, about 20 individuals. Subgroups started to materialize from the human social service needs component and housing needs and the economic development agencies and Lakeshore Advantage would be getting together and, and, and talking with their constituents and others about what those needs are. And so we compartmentalize what our priorities are with these recovery funds. One bucket that we we'll call them buckets, right, affectionately, was broadband. We've known for a long time that the traditional business model of this infrastructure deployment just creates inequities. And that was so obviously highlighted during the pandemic with the state home board. It's going to take, there's so many variables that affect this model of broadband deployment, but it requires change. And it requires what we're driving for. I could do a whole presentation on what we're thinking about for broadband. I can do that at some point. But it's going to require new thinking. Uh, public private partnership, more than likely, it's a business model for the private sector. But this is a utility that's essential. We've got to figure out how to make that happen. We believe we're on the right path. The other priority, affordable housing. We all know these challenges with affordable housing. I mean, the cost of a home right now, about $360,000. That's so limiting for so many people to afford that. Yes, the cost of a home, materials, all that is a lot. Right? It, this is the same type of mechanism that's going to require some creative, innovative collaboration to address those challenges. Social human service is the other bucket. And as that group of community leaders started to talk about these community and individual needs, two items elevated to the surface. Child care. Child care is so important when you look at that zero to five age and having quality care is so important for developmental growth. And also, child care is one of the, the number one burdens uh, families, individuals, young children. Child care can be their number one financial burden. That is an area that is really important need to address. The other item in this bucket of social human needs, mental health support services. Now that certainly rose as a, a greater challenge and, and a, a community need that's talked about more and should be talked about more. We're so fortunate as a county, we were the first county in the state to pass a village for dedicated community mental health services. But we realized through all this and students, and young professionals and others, there's more support that's needed in this space. And and more choices and more pathways to receive services. That is the other bucket. Fourth bucket, business stabilization. Our business needs are great to continue to thrive, to make it through this pandemic and recover and move forward. Broadband takes care of that, right? It's a part of it, right? Broadband access is huge when you think about workforce. Number one, the number one chance for a business community to work for. Broadband is part of that. Affordable housing is a part of this. But there's also workforce development needs. There's automation needs. And there's other capital needs for businesses. So that is the other important bucket to look at. And then the last bucket, county initiatives, um, to ensure that we continue to deliver the active and needed public services on a large scale across the county. And I would say that of this $56 million, we haven't really defined, I get this question all the time, well, how much money is in each bucket? We're not putting boundaries on the bucket amount. As a, as a committee, we're talking about, you know, to help guide what our needs are, we have put some dollars into these buckets, but we're not pitching. 
don't know what these real objects may be coming into each spot. So we've got to have some flexibility. And even when I think about broadband, yes, we're setting aside some money for broadband, but there's other dollars that's becoming available for infrastructure and investment, uh, infrastructure investment, Jobs Act, and other funding coming through the state. So we're balancing those elements out. But ultimately, the county board is committed to using all $56.7 million towards addressing community needs. What we also realize through this process, one of the strategic components to our plan and our, and our process is to continue to engage as close as possible with those that need support. As a county, we don't necessarily have close tie relationships with, for example, the business community. Right? The chambers and Lakeshore Advantage connect with the business community. And when I think about you know, affordable housing, we're not as connected with other nonprofit agencies dealing in the affordable housing space. So we need, I'm affectionate to referring to them as bucket managers, right? They are conduits into the community that will partner with the county to identify solicit projects, evaluate them as our bucket managers, and then bring these recommended projects to the committee for evaluation and then ultimately for final approval to the Board of Commissioners. Going through the lens of criteria, meeting the bucket priorities, and then the funds would be distributed to projects and we would engage in that evaluative component of impact. What we did fairly recently and where we're at right now is we created and released a request for proposals to secure these managers for buckets. And of the five buckets, we're just looking for bucket managers for three. The county initiatives and broadband we're uh, wrestling with um, as a county and with other partners, but it's affordable housing, business stabilization, and human social needs. These managers, conduit in that space. Those proposals were due last Monday on Valentine's Day. We are in the process now of evaluating the proposals that were submitted. Uh, we intend to conduct some interviews of those interested entities within the next few weeks. And it is my hope that by early summer, late spring, right, that we can be into the community as a county and with our partners identifying projects, creating awareness of these funds and how we're looking to spend them and what we're we're looking to see happen because of these dollars. So I'm very um, it, again it's an honor for me to be a part of that group of individuals uh, and everyone else working in the community to see how we what we can do. Again, it's so important for us to be very thoughtful about what those needs are. These are incredible dollars to have and I'm very confident that we can make the right impact to, to meet needs and, and transform how we support our community for vibrancy in the future. Thank you very much for listening. If projects materialize that meet those needs, we could, for instance, it could move fairly quick. Maybe we hire bucket managers uh, formally in March. They start to release in April and pulling projects in. Maybe <coughs> this is hypothetical. Could go this fast. By July, we have some projects. Maybe there's some affordable housing projects that are shovel ready that need some additional financing to, to help with the mechanics of the deal. We could be ready launching projects by summer or fall. Other ones may take a little longer, of course, but we want to activate this as soon as we're able. Anybody else?
Yes, I'm glad you asked that. We, that was another area of priorities that we started to wrestle with. And even looking at through all the lenses of, uh, of opportunity, evaluation, what's transformative? What are the areas of greatest need? Yes, there are needs for wastewater expansion for industry and wastewater extensions. When we think about some of our groundwater challenges that we have with the county, definitely a high priority. But there are other avenues of funding that we are also assessing. And we know, for example, there are some wastewater projects that have been brought forward to us and we're talking through. It's very expensive, right? The large chunks of money. We would take 25%, 50% of our 56 million towards a project in a single area. When we think about all the criteria and needs and greatest needs and impact and what households and individuals need that can elevate it above wastewater for these dollars. But we're committed to addressing those infrastructure needs through other avenues of funding. Yep. Big thank you to Paul. State legislators up to the front. We're fortunate to have State Senator Roger Vickery with us and State Representatives Luke Nierman and Jim Willoughby. And as they make their way up to the front, Paul, I just want to congratulate you. I, mean, I think that process that you're taking and coming through is one that we can all be very proud of. It's, it's pretty impressive. So thank you for your hard work on that. A lot, I'll put it that way. So uh, I can take about 15 minutes on that, but I want to make a comment to uh, consider my other colleagues there. So, uh, appropriations time. There's uh, a lot of money on a balance sheet for the state of Michigan. And when there's those dollars available, it makes our job all the more difficult appropriating. Because it's always, when there's not the funds there, it's easy to say no. Now our task is how do we leverage these dollars? These are one time dollars to use that term, transformational change, generational change, and uh, how are we effective, make it effective on that. So one area that's uh, on the side this week, because I'll be launching up an initiative, I've been working with a number of colleagues, and the uh, genesis of this came a little bit when we, uh, we were able to, within 14 days, address a critical need for our auto industry and mobility, and come up with over a billion dollars. And when we did that, I was analyzing this, like, hmm, fine, here we go again. We are always seem to be addressing that auto industry. But what other areas of the state have we neglected for the last three decades? And there's a common theme. Our rural communities, our food security areas, lessons learned from COVID. So I'll be uh, introducing a comprehensive package, rural economic development and food security that will address these issues. It's uh, just a little bit under our uh, mobility package, or auto package, that was $1.4 billion. This is gonna be a tad bit under here, there, but also addresses things right here in Ottawa County, we are here in here. Our uh, infrastructure, we could expand numerous different industries. I could name these industries right off the top here, which I won't uh, impose upon, but uh, they're looking to expand to the tune of 10 million, 50 million, over 100 million. One issue is water processing, sewer availability, capacity. A lot of these industries are located in smaller communities and they have a population of 3,000, and yet that community can't burn this cost of a $15 million water treatment expansion. Uh, throughout the state, to the northern part, I had an opportunity to have uh, some young farmers from Michigan Farm Rural visit the Farm Data Leadership Conference. And the opportunities throughout the state is huge. We learned from protein processing the availability of having, we can grow it right here, but we're, how do we process it? It's been you know, consolidated in the hands of a few, and how do we bring that to our local level? How about our urban communities, where we've seen empty store shelves, we talk about food deserts in that area, but I mean, it was literally a, um, can we get, why was that occurring? Our logistic systems, our distribution systems, 
Uh, we had Myers would like to put an additional uh, distribution center in the state of Michigan, but our arcade tax policy, it looks like it's going to be pushed to Ohio. That can't be allowed to occur. If it goes in Ohio, that, that stands up transportation links for our Michigan producers. So that's our area. And then research. My goodness. We have neglected to put any dollars on research for our agriculture community, our rural area, and our sustainability. I went across uh, had off to drive to Michigan State University with a, uh, a gentleman from the area, 80 some years old, very conservative, and he described that well, if I was going to go to Michigan State University in the dairy program, the greenhouse industry, uh, with these facilities, I, mean, I could get a degree in history, but not research. That's how bad these facilities are. So here's an opportunity to, with bipartisan approach, address a need that has been neglected for three decades across the state of Michigan and not just go down that same road we've done and, and basically flip the script on that. And uh, so I'll leave. That's my district. I know uh, there's a big group coming into Lansing on Tuesday. We're going to get the bill number by, I got to have it by 1 o'clock, get some co sponsorship on it. I know uh, Representative Neerman, you've been working on part of it. But instead of an ad hoc component, it's comprehensive and Chair Thomas and Shirky had smiles on the face of not making here. I mean, of course, you're asking for a lot here, but they love the concept. Con transformational, comprehensive. Let's make it happen and let's bring it to our rural communities. Thanks, Raj. I'll, I'll dovetail off of what you said just a little bit here. I, I think in a little bit higher level, you know, as we think about uh, all the resources that we have here at the local uh, county level to deploy as a result of, of our funding, we also have uh, significant dollars at the state level as well. And sort of the general, um, you know, thinking I think that we had um, from an Ottawa County delegation perspective is we, we want to make sure that we're deploying as much of those dollars into long-term infrastructure projects as possible. You know, there's so much incentive short-term programs um, at the state level, there's there's always a lot of, um, you know, sort of clamor to do that. But at the end of the day, we have to be good stewards of these dollars, and we want to make sure that um, because we're incurring significant debt, we're better vulnerable to fund this, that, that there's significant benefit over a long period of time to sort of match up with that. And so I think, you, you know, whether you're looking at the federal level uh, in our partners in the congressional delegation or the state level with us or the county level, I think we all have a very similar thought process of, of how those dollars need to get deployed. Um, you know, we've also been very thoughtful about you know, how do we uh, provide some incentives to businesses to, uh, to recover from the pandemic. And, and one of the things that we've done at the state level uh, in the legislature over the last you know, sort of couple of weeks, we did pass some uh, tax relief, basically doubling the uh, personal property tax exemption uh, for, for small businesses. And so we've taken that from, I think, about eight grand to 180 grand. Um, so some of that work that we did back in 2012, 2015 to improve that uh, situation then we, we built off of that now. Um, I'll, specifically in my committee, my rules and competitiveness committee that I chair, um, we're working on a number of things right now, but one of the things that we're working on is a small fix uh, to some of the um, uh, insurance situation that we have for autos in our state. Um, when we went through some of the reform over the last few years, we sort of left out uh, the party buses and created a situation where uh, their party buses and limousines are not on par with uh, taxi cabs and Uber and Lyft and things like that. So there's a gap that basically is making their insurance incredibly expensive. We heard from people uh, that would come testify in front of our committee that their insurance rates were going from about $2,500 a year, uh, $3,000 a year, all the way up to uh, like $30,000 a year. Uh, and that's gotten to be obviously unsustainable. And so what's gonna happen is essentially that limousine party bus uh, stuff is gonna just go away because the businesses won't be able to afford that. So that's something that we're working on in, in that committee and expect to uh, hear some more uh, in the next couple of weeks. But uh, also working on some legislation uh, related to uh, the sort of caregiver uh, folks in the uh, cannabis space in Michigan, making sure that uh, all patients have access to safe, tested, and tracked uh, cannabis. We want to make sure that people are circumventing the uh, system now that we have both a recreational and medical market in Michigan. I do want to make sure we've got some time for questions, so I'll kick it over to Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'll just focus my comments on uh, school safety. 
Um, Speaker Wentworth put together a uh, school safety task force. Uh, just after Thanksgiving last year, we've had dozens of meetings since then. And this is a response to Oxford. Um, as you can imagine, there's a tremendous amount of uh, passion around this issue and just perspectives on how things need, what we need to do to make things safer. Uh, so we'll get some important things accomplished. I'm excited about that. Um, we've got eight de four Democrats and eight Republicans, four Democrats, four Republicans, bipartisan committee. Um, I think I just want to reach out to you to say if you have ideas along school mental health in particular, um, please reach out to me. I do think that's one of the bigger areas that we're going to kind of jump into and try to um, have effect in. As you can as you can think of school hardening and you've seen that at the school level, um, the double doors, walking in, talking to secretary first. You know, those kind of things uh, have been done and, and, and more of that will be done. Um, but I think the piece that's been left out to some extent is how we help those kids uh, before something happens, how do we get to them uh, before. And as you can imagine, um, things are just escalating as far as the need for school mental health. So I just want to throw that out there. What we're looking for is uh, effective um, boots on the ground, what is working for these kids in particular. So uh, please reach out. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got about five minutes left. We've got about five minutes left. Uh, does anybody have a question? Otherwise, I've got lots of them. So uh, anybody for any question to ask? Yes. Uh, what about timing? So just to recap the question, what is the timing of some of the state appropriation conversations you're having? When are we going to start seeing more information coming about coming out about how we want to allocate the dollars we have today? Well, the first step is uh, the governor has introduced her budget and the budget process, of the appropriation process has begun. So that's where some of the first wave of these dollars. As I indicated too, there's uh, other supplemental expenditures such as what I'll be uh, introducing this week. Uh, and that moves along. So you have the your supplementals and the uh, ongoing budget. And then some of these items that may be included in supplementals have been included in the governor's budget component and how we navigate through there. So uh, those who serve on appropriations uh, are going to be busy. Uh, I'm one of those. I have the general government budget and also the uh, NDAR budget. And Chair Cummings also serve on the transportation uh, subcommittee and in our uh, Eagle. So, uh, the discussions are continuing and going on in person and Zoom, and uh, my schedule is pretty filled up here. So stay tuned and we're moving forward.
Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm not going to answer your question very well. I'm going to say, uh, you know, my wife and I did foster care, and I've been in that mental health role myself. Um, it's something I, I should check into. I don't really understand the adult side of things well, or what, you know, the repercussions are. I know, you know, generally we can't force medications on somebody, and that's often kind of what triggers the downward spiral if, if that adult decides not to. Um, so I don't have a real good answer to that, but I do think there's a lot of room to work there. Um, it's just not getting smaller, I think, you know, on the childhood side of mental health. What we've seen is the demand is far outstripping anything that we're providing right now. Tom, I appreciate you bringing this forward. Uh, your stories there are similar throughout the state, and this is something that came, some of these stories are a result, well, stories indicate when COVID occurred, we did not have those interactions when the adult services weren't being out in a timely fashion in those areas, maybe have been through restrictions, those areas, but uh, there's a lot of work to be done, so much work to be done, because now it's time we, that conveyor belt kept moving, and yet the attendees were not there. Um, I just know firsthand, not quite similar on that area, but with guardianships and conservatorships, uh, I had a special hearing as chair appropriate and chair of judiciary and public safety. We were in Oakland County. Thank goodness here on the west side state, we don't have issues with the guardianship and conservatorships, but the neglect, the abuse, the system is in some of the areas, it's not surprising because the, the funding for the guardianship aspect, it's like, I can see why this has occurred. And so I know the attorney general has been working on this issue. Uh, I, she has an approach that's a little bit different than mine, and some of the, uh, my committee members are very passionate about it because they even have family members. Um, so that's, there's a, a general theme that is out there, and the, this is going to come more and more to the forefront of our adults that are being failed on all aspects of the conservatorship, the guardianships, and the adult uh, care. And I just make one more comment on this. I mean, I, I don't think there's any doubt, and I wish Representative White were here to talk about this, because I think this is a space that she's going to spend a lot of time in, but there's no doubt we're short on beds in the state. As we've moved away from institutionalizing these patients, we've also um, moved away from having the facilities to, to do it, and as we've had an uptick in some of this, I think that it's just, just the infrastructure is a little bit lacking, and that's maybe something that the state can participate in and help, but I think we have to be careful about trying to solve this problem at the state level compared to the local level, because much like you pointed out, there was a whole group of people that sort of came together to provide the wraparound services that a person in that situation needs. And I don't think that's something that the state can do very well on its own. I think it really requires the institutions that exist within local communities to come together to, to build a support structure that exists, because ultimately what ends up happening is someone does get institutionalized for a short period of time or, or something like that, and then as they come out, they don't have the network and the support structure. That's where I think the, the local, um, you know, sort of network makes so much of a difference, and that's going to be different, you know, in all communities around the state. I think we're particularly lucky here in Ottawa County to have a lot of those services. If that doesn't exist everywhere, but that doesn't mean that we, you know, we, we shouldn't try to incentivize that to happen. So we should keep moms out of the state to help services? That's super. I don't know that that's exactly what I'm saying. I, I don't know enough. I don't know enough about it. Um, I, I think what what I'm suggesting is to just solve it by throwing money at it at the state level, whether it's building out institutions or, or something else. I don't know that that's necessarily the way to do it. I think we have to empower local organizations to uh, involve themselves in that. And maybe that is shifting some of those resources, but that would be premature for me to make that comment. This is a great conversation, and I'm glad that everyone's engaged. Unfortunately, the clock is uh, we've already gone past three minutes over, and so uh, we're going to have to wrap things up here. But uh, we will be back here March 21st. We will allow more time for our state legislators to, to weigh in on the various topics that you're all interested in. We're also going to hear from your favorite and lovable uh, West Michigan political reporter, Rick Alvin, who's going to give us an update on redistricting. So that will be the topic here at 8 o'clock, uh, March 21st. We look forward to seeing you all then. Please stick around, as the legislators always do. If you have things you want to talk about, please feel free to. Otherwise, thank you so much for being with us today. Have a great week.